Ένα-δύο. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, it's working, great. Sorry about the slight delay there, but it's a great pleasure to welcome you here in Rhodes on the campus for the annual Tarina Conference of 2004. When I arrived last night in Rhodes, the sun had gone down, but I read in my um, little brochure in my hotel room that Rhodes was on the meeting point of three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So I think it's a very appropriate place for the scientific and academic community to come together to discuss the future of networking that hopefully covers all of those continents. So certainly in Europe and perhaps a little bit beyond Europe these days. So um, it is my pleasure to uh, chair the first session. My name is Jane Butler, a director of, um, of uh, Cisco Systems. And um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Maglaris. Uh, Professor Maglaris is the um, chairman of the board of GRNet, the host NREN for the Torino Conference this year. And I've known Professor Maglaris for a number of years, and he's one of the leading lights in this part of the world in the NREN community. So it's with great pleasure that I ask Professor Maglaris to open the conference today. Thank you, Jane. It is really a pleasure to have you here in Greece and in Rhodes. Like you said, it is really the crossing point of three continents. And we noticed that yesterday, overlooking from a very terrific terrace, uh, the harbor of uh, Rhodos, and seeing uh, all the monuments of all cultures uh, uh, melted together. So we are very glad to have you here. Also, we are very glad to have two key people of this conference uh, of uh, the female gender, and this is uh, the chairwoman of Terena, and uh, of course, uh, uh, you're the chair in this first session. So, uh, apart from that, let me just say that uh, if you have been around for, for a long time, you probably recognize this tie. This tie was uh, distributed at the Terena conference uh, a few years ago. So I'm wearing it, uh, but I'm the only one that wears a tie in here. So, um, uh, apart from our honorary guests. So, at any rate, I thought it would be appropriate to wear a Terena tie today, and uh, thank you very much for your kind words. Let me say that we have the honor today of having with us uh, the General Secretary for Research and Technology of Greece, uh, Ioannis Tsukalas. Uh, professor Tsukalas uh, is a professor at uh, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and was the chairman of uh, the Department of Informatics at uh, this university, and uh, also a member of the board of GRNet until he became a 
General Secretary of Research and Technology. Uh, professor Tukalas, a Colton professor and colleague of ours, is going to tell us a few words about uh, his vision about the Greek state's vision on uh, the ARENA and on research network and overall. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And my thanks go mainly to Vasilis, who, who was kind enough to invite me to say a few words about the uh, vision of the Greek state, the, the new Greek government, about uh, the Terena initiative and uh, your conference. Uh, the Greek government is looking forward in enhancing such very successful initiatives, bringing together uh, technologies and people. We are very proud of what the Greek part of uh, Terena and Vasilis Maglaris and his team have already achieved. We are looking forward to hear from you and from your conference and the things you might probably be kind enough to suggest on the right direction and for the extension of uh, such initiatives. It is true that uh, Greece is uh, lagging behind both in uh, quantitative achievements in research and development. We are lagging because uh, we are spending uh, uh, just few monies for research and technology. It is only 0.7% of the GDP and since the uh, Lisboa declaration demands from the European member states to achieve a clear 3% of their GDP. Uh, we have uh, promised to double the sum we are spending, that is uh, from 0.7, we will achieve a 1.5 by 2010. The difficulty being that uh, the uh, European Union envisages that such spending should be coming 70% uh, from uh, business and 1% uh, from public spending. That is uh, pretty crucial and we are very eager to see how we can achieve it. I wish you a very successful and pleasant conference. We are uh, looking uh, forward in uh, obtaining your results. And as far as the General Secretariat for Research and Technology is concerned, we will do anything in our power to assist you and enhance your activities. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for a, a wonderful introduction to the conference. Um, I'd now like to introduce one further introductory speaker before we begin our main uh, plenary session this afternoon. Uh, we have with us uh, the host, um, rector of the University of the Aegean. Um, he's also a professor of information and communication systems for the university. So I'd like to welcome Professor Katsikas onto stage very quickly to add further introduction from the local host. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon. I realize I'm standing between you and what promises to be a very interesting presentation, so I'll keep it really short. Uh, just a few words about the, the University of the Aegean, who is hosting this event. What you have now seen on the island of Rhodes is about 20% of the overall University of the Aegean, which is dispersed on five islands of the Aegean, in Lesbos, Chios, Samos, Rhodes, and Syros. And as you probably realize, this makes it terribly difficult for the, for the rector to manage it on one hand. And on the other, it explains why it is one of the first universities in, uh, in Greece that incorporated information and communication technologies into its daily practices very early, simply because it was a need for doing so. So uh, you will have the chance 
uh, in, in your discussions with my colleagues here in Rhodes to find out that the University of Lucien had one of the very first academic networks in Greece and one of the very advanced ones. It is still among the most advanced ones technologically and it certainly is the one which covers, spans the greatest, the largest geographical area. Just to give you an indication of that, Rhodes from Lesbos has a distance of about 600 kilometers. So we are really all over the place. It's a big university. We have about, uh, not about, we have 16 departments and uh, 22 postgraduate programs. That makes us the fifth largest university in Greece, even though we were established only 20 years ago back in 1984. So uh, I guess this is enough. I should also tell you enough information about the university at this stage. My colleagues will be happy to provide you with any more that you would like to have possibly during your stay. I should uh, congratulate GRNet for, for having this, uh, this event in Greece at this time. I'm, I have been following the, the work of GRNet pretty closely for the past few years because I have also the privilege of uh, being a member of the advisory board of GRNet. Apparently some people think that my expertise in uh, uh, information communication system security can be of some, of some uh, help, scientific help, apart from <laughs> administrative uh, work that I've been doing as a rector and vice rector for so many years in the university. So, uh, welcome in Greece, welcome in Rhodes, and welcome in the University of Lugian. I'm certain that you will have a very interesting uh, conference, so I don't need to wish you success with the conference. I will wish you a pleasant, uh, a pleasant stay, and I hope that you will not rush away to the beaches too early, or at least not too much, not, not more than required. And uh, I also wish you to come back to Greece soon, preferably in August, so that you can also be part of the great event that our country will be hosting then and of course, I mean the Olympic Games. So, many thanks for this uh, opportunity to shortly introduce you. And uh, I'm also looking forward to a very successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Katsikas. Um, so now I have the great pleasure to, uh, to introdu introduce to you a very um, dear, dear friend of mine in the academic community. We've uh, known one another a number of years. I'm talking, of course, of uh, Professor Peter Kirsten. And uh, I know he's very worried about what I might say about him here. So <laughs> I promise not to embarrass him too much. But this has been quite a year for Peter. Um, he's had two very important awards um, firstly, he's received the John Postel Award for services to the internet, and at the same time, he was also awarded a CBE in the Queen's birthday honours, or New Year's honours, Peter, birthday honours in the UK for services to internet working research. So quite um, some honours for Peter, and Peter's been um, working on the internet since it started in fact, he was responsible for its start, I believe, in the, certainly in London anyway. Um, so uh, most recently, I've worked with Peter on a couple of projects. Firstly, the SixNet project, and we have a workshop here this week. Many of you know about the SixNet project. And uh, Peter has played an extremely important and valuable role in guiding the young people in that consortium towards the next generation of the internet using IPv6. In addition, Peter and I have worked on the Silk project together, which again is breaking down new barriers, bringing the internet into the Central Asia and, and Caucasian countries. And as you may know, that was started by the NATO Science Committee when, when Peter was chairing the committee. And uh, even though he only chaired the committee for one year, he's continued to be director of the Silk project since then. And it's uh, been a fascinating project to work on. And so just before Peter comes on stage, I have one little story. It's about the Silk Project. And we were in Baku in Azerbaijan, attending one of the Silk Board meetings together. And we were sitting over lunch, and I was sitting next to uh, Peter's wife, Gwen, who often travels with him. 
And uh, we were debating over lunch some problems with some of the satellite equipment on the network. And um, I was kind of uh, encouraging Peter to really get firm with the supplier and really push for a resolution. And he was being so calm and, and quiet about this. Um, and so I, he, he got up and left and obviously went off to meet the satellite supplier to dis debate uh, the technical problems that we were having at that stage. And I turned to Gwen, I said, why is he so calm? How does he get things done? And she said, he just uses the cursed in stare and with a twinkle in his eye, things get done. And that's Peter over, over and over again. And he's able to get things done time and time again. And therefore, he's been instrumental in advancing the state of the internet all over the European and the Central Asian Caucasian countries. So without further ado, Peter, I'll hand the stage to you. If I could have some slides, it would help. <laughs> Sorry? Hit the escape button, okay. We need internet. Yeah, well, I thought so. that we could just connect it to the line. Well, if it's there. Yeah. yeah. It's built on internet. That's. Can somebody give us internet, please? The, the you can't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes like this. But if worse comes to worse, it'd be better to have slides here than, it, than not having a yeah, report at all. Of course. But Started anyway with this. Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we? 
we starting with? Uh, I think we're starting with this, maybe. Have we got a... Uh, Well, Jane, thank you for those kind words. Uh, when I was majoring in Greek history and was uh, hearing about the problems of uh, Samos, Lesbos, Rhodes uh, with the Athenians back some 2,500 years ago, I, I never really expected to be doing anything uh, like talking about history of a rather more recent nature here but I am delighted to do so. And uh, Mr. Rector, I, this is a wonderful place to do it. It's always difficult to give a 20-year perspective. Does one concentrate on what happened 20 years ago, which probably don't in, doesn't interest people very much, but it's the one thing which people don't know. Does one say things about what's happening now where probably lots of other people know much more about it than I do. So I hope I've got the right balance, but I certainly can't guarantee it. I'll do, we'll talk a bit about the background, but if you're gonna talk about the background and uh, what happens, you actually need to know what was the status 20 years ago in 1984. And once I've discussed a little bit the status, uh, there are lots of wars in different times, some more violent than others, and perhaps the protocol war was one of the more violent in those days. After the protocol wars, one consolidated to a particular idea of how networks should go. Some of it was happening the other side of the Atlantic. There was some consolidation in Europe. And so the next thing I talk about is European connectivity. But uh, the Europeans have always had a tradition of being connected to the rest of the world. So I talk a bit about foreign connectivity, advanced services, and a little bit about the future. If we start off with a background, I'm going to talk mainly about academic service networks i.e. things about networks for research, not about network research. It gets actually rather difficult to make a distinction at times because so often uh, things drift apart, come together, drift apart, come together. And this may become obvious in the talk. But I won't say very much about telecom networks unless those telecom networks are connected to 
the research networks. I'll concentrate on the European level. This is a Terena conference. We're concerned with what's happened in the last uh, 20 years of European networking. But you can't actually talk about Europe without the US. Too often we've looked at foreign policies and wanted to do those without the US. It's just not possible. Uh, but I won't consider national activities in this talk, and I'll certainly cover mainly the last two decades. Well, if we do go to the 1984, what was the US scene? And many of us, including me, had forgotten quite what it was. There were lots of mission-oriented networks. NASA had one, which is DECnet-based, called the Space Physics Analysis Network. There was uh, an IP version of it, the uh, NASA Science Network, under consideration. The Department of Energy had one network, except for the fact I can't spell, one network for fusion, which had completely proprietary uh, protocols based on Livermore, and everybody was connecting to it. HEPnet, high energy physics network, uh, was also being run, DECnet based, by the Department of Energy. DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, had actually uh, started the ARPANET some 15 years earlier. Some year before that, it had transitioned completely from uh, the old ARPANET technology, which had all of uh, 64 nodes at most, with four hosts per node, to this huge space of up to four billion hosts, if they could be used properly. There had actually been a separation uh, under the, in the Defense Department from the research network ARPANET to the network still of a research type doing sort of quasi-operational unclassified activity run by uh, the Defense Inf uh, Information Systems Agency. And uh, the National Science Foundation had just started a mission-oriented network. It's been running for about a year or two. Uh, CSNet, which was a computer science network. And they were actually, uh, they'd started the proper uh, use of ARPANET protocols and from the beginning, there was a requirement for gateways to the ARPANET. There were the federal agencies. IBM had started the BitNet project. In that, uh, they provided software, uh, the new, entirely on new IBM mainframes, and uh, one provided links to the next IBM mainframe, and there was already quite a few I can't remember the exact number, but I think it was hundreds of computers connected, but with fairly simple uh, services, the sort you'd get from one mainframe to another or people onto mainframes. There was mail, there was some file uh, transfer, not very interactive. And then there was for mail, Usenet and PhoneNet. There were activities in Europe. There were very few real NREM. I'm doing something very dangerous. I'm going by things I find on the net to what I think was the actual research networks then in existence. I'm sure I'll be told afterwards. I've been unfair to some countries. But I think the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the UK were the main ones which actually had something which could be called an NREN. There was the uh, COM conferencing system in Norway and Sweden, that ran the Comca protocols. There were already quite a few public data networks run by the uh, telecoms agencies, but they were pretty expensive, and you couldn't really afford to run them for research, university research uh, traffic unless they were pretty heavily subsidized. There was the first international node for CSNet in Karlsruhe. It ran IP. In fact, that was the one of those which didn't last very long because it soon became a company. France had lots and lots of nets. INRIA ran one, the research uh, agency ran one, the universities still had 
the six node uh, one dating from the 70s. But there wasn't a single NREN at the time at all. And in fact, there was quite a few years before there was a single NREN in France. The UK uh, had had links to the ARPANET for some time, and they had actually run something which had become, first of all, the Science Research Net, then Janet, and they did have proper links to the US uh, between the colored book protocols which they were running and both SATNET, which I can't remember if I say something about, and IPSS, which is an international packet switch service. That was a real connection between an NREN and the US networks. There were some SATNET service sites. There was a SATNET project in the 70s, which was using a satellite in a fairly novel way. It was the first time one tried to get a single uplink used by a number of downlinks. We had a lot of troubles persuading CCITT and the ITU to even give us a tariff for such a novel service. Nobody quite knew what was happening. Uh, it did use IP, and it involved Germany, Italy, Sweden, and the UK. Uh, one of the uh, interesting parts to me of it is in the latest networks I'm using in the Caucasus and Central Asia, I'm using a very similar technology, but uh, slightly modernized over the last 20 years. Uh, but even that one only had the UK NREN connected. In the others, mainly because of telecom problems of one sort or another, it was a single university or a single defense institute which was connected. CERN has always had an infinite number of networks of all types, and this was no exception. They had CERN net, which was proprietary, they had X25 switch, they were running DEC net, uh, they had intersite traffic from the whole of the uh, high energy physics community. So they had a lot, but it was all really centered on CERN. Uh, although, if there were any uh, national networks, it was probably possible to get through them to get to CERN. The European, again I can't spell, but that binet is bitnet, the European bitnet called the European Academic Research, the European Academic Research Network, was uh, uh, proposed and was very nearly implemented uh, at that stage. That was the European version of the US BitNet, but the first site had not yet come online. It came online in August of, 2000, uh, of, of 1984. It used entirely IBM proprietary uh, protocols, and then lots and lots of people using UNET for mail, using UUCP. There were a lot of early research protocols. There was a development of the OSI protocols versus the internet, TCP versus uh, the uh, connectionless network service or connection-oriented network services. There was file transfer versus uh, the, uh, the um, ARPA versus, versus the uh, ISO one. There was X400 versus SMTP for mail. There, everybody agreed that if one's going to use anything for directories, it would, would be X500. There was triple X versus Telnet. There was a question of Ethernet versus Cambridge ring or token rings. Most of those have died later, of course. Many tried to define and live with the OSI family. The Germans were very, very keen on it. So were the Norwegians. Many worked on X400 and X500. You can see by the fact that there was X400 and X500 in 1984 that these were underway at that stage. A lot of people are looking at the impact of PTT services, ISDN, X25, Videotext, Teletext, Facsimile, but those were slightly different. They might have been access networks, they might have been services. They weren't the service you would normally run on an academic network. With all this confusion, there was of course lots of work on gateways and adaptation from one thing to another. And there were some complete systems uh, of which probably the UK had gone further than most, defining a complete island of uh, colored book protocols 
uh, isolated, separate, and different from most of the rest of the world. A few people adopted it, but it was on the whole a, a British island. Well, obviously, I'm setting the scene for the protocol wars. The US uh, uh, nets had mainly leased lines. The European had X25. Uh, OSI had its seven layers that had to fight SNA on the, I, on the IBM side, DECnet, the internet, colored book, all were fighting each other. Each uh, layer and each proponent of each layer uh, generated arguments, including whether that layer was the right place, whether one should do gatewaying at that level, whether one should combine lots of network layers to, before one did one's gatewaying. It was a mess, but at least it provided plenty of funding for, if you can call it research, research. There were a lot of different groups working on standards. Uh, CCITT was working on improving X25, X400, X500, and XXX. ISO was working on the higher levels of file, presentation, uh, international alphabet, transport. The IETF was working on lots and lots of different internet protocols, but in fact, actually, they only started in 1986. Before that, we had uh, the international, uh, the IAB, the Internet Activities Board, and in fact, the Internet Con uh, Collaboration Board, which is a fence version of it, and which I think I killed uh, three, four months ago, but uh, it was uh, working already at that stage. DEC was working on the DECnet protocols, and lots of people were working with DEC on that. IBM on the, and its proponents on uh, the various SNA and EARN protocols. The British had a very active lot on the colored books. There was a significant amount of cross-filing of standards as each tried to get the other international standards bodies to accept their protocols as the standard and therefore win in this battle. From 84 to 90, there was a lot of consolidation. And incidentally, some interesting things happened to it. For instance, one of my people was extremely unhappy when I was prepared to put uh, the SMTP mail protocols on top of X25 uh, with mine. They said, but that would interfere with X400, which allowed uh, binary and various other things. And that was weakening our battle. Well, probably I didn't know which battle I was fighting, so I uh, still continue to do it. But lots of these mixings took place. Bitnet, Internet, Decnet, CERNnet, UCP were all put above X25. The uh, purists said that mustn't happen. They must all stay above TCP IP, at least when IBM had been persuaded to put BitNet and DEC to put DECnet over uh, the internet protocols. Worse still, in the view of some of the British purists, we put X400 and X500 on top of TCP IP. That wasn't allowed either. There was a complete vertical set of uh, stacks defined, and that was war. And then BitNet 2, DECnet were really proper TCIP protocols by the time they were finished. This started allowing the possibility of a single network infrastructure with multiple families uh, to exist. You could start talking about uh, EARN, OSI, Internet, all running over an X25 uh, network. Uh, those who wanted to fight a battle did some national fighting and killed one or other of those nationally. Some and I remember Italy was one, ran for quite a while all three network activities uh, on their single X25 network. Uh, you could also have BitNet, DECnet, X400, X500, all running over TCP IP over an internet one. And that happened for a while. And then what happened on the US? Because again, that is something which has always guided us in it, not always, we don't always agree, but we've always watched. They kept their remit only for their own researchers. 
So in fact, around about 1988, ARPANET and SATNET were properly decommissioned. There was still a lot of research networks. Uh, these were networks which were just for DARPA researchers. There was DARPNET, there was the Gigabit Network, which for the first time uh, wanted to put Gigabit onto the desktop back in 1991. Uh, there was CAN, which was a test bed for IPv6. And we must remember that at the time when we in Europe were saying there was no interest in IPv6 in the US, and it's certainly true in, well, it, was, it was certainly true in some of the commercial uh, parts, the US had a network going all the way across the US with some 20 nodes, I would say at the time, involving a professional carrier as well, MCI, and with links to the UK, all devoted to looking at IPv6 multicast, uh, IPv6 NS, uh, DNS, secure DNS, etc. All things which are still current now. So from a research community, they were interested. But that, that's much further forward. NSF started NSFNet in 86. And the way it started itself was only to connect the five supercomputer centers they had just started. And it was to connect them at very high speed, unparalleled, 64 kilobits a second, all supercomputers. In fact, they soon had to increase it because there were two other supercomputers. There were ones run by the Department of Energy and uh, NCAR, which I can't remember, Atmospheric Research, it must have been NASA. They had to be added in. And so you actually had to go above 64 kilobits. And in fact, within a couple of years, they were up to 1.5 megabits, and then two or three years later, up to 45 megabits. Uh, they set up a regional nets. That was, by the way, the first time one got this little question. Should the commercials be involved? We haven't quite resolved this question even now, but there was a policy, a really important policy decision made in 1988 that they would uh, have the NSF responsible for a backbone. They would set up regional networks in all the regions of the US, which could be private companies and for profit if they wanted, with some subsidy coming from National Science Foundation. There were certain uh, regions which would, would just weren't going to be economic at that stage, which they would keep uh, subsidizing completely, and they would keep their foreign links for a while. And that, in fact, worked until 1995, by which time uh, everything had become established on a commercial basis. And also, at the same time, the Department of Energy ESNet NASA had moved to IP nets by somewhere between 86 and 90. So by now you had a situation where things were consolidated in the US. And between 98, 1988 and 90, uh, the, uh, the federal agencies set up a federal interchanges under something called the, Fe uh, first of all, the uh, Federal Networking Council, and then the Federal Research Gotten what Frick stood for. It had somewhat limited facilities in the interchange, and this limitation was partly technical, uh, that they couldn't, and partly political, because there were certain services they didn't actually want to have going from one to the other. They were already then very worried about the security impacts of having too much interchange between these networks. But one of the things this allowed was it allowed the sharing of international connections while the agencies themselves kept physical infrastructures separate. And they started encouraging the outsourcing of many services. For instance, I've already mentioned the National Science Foundation outsourced first the regional and then later the backbone of their network. NASA eventually outsourced the whole of the National Science Network. NSF DARPA uh, started this very interesting project where the management of the gigabit network was from a, mm, I suppose you'd call it a private company that was owned by Bob Kahn, who'd been doing much of the other stuff earlier, uh, to manage the gigabit network and the provision of most of the networking facilities were from the carriers 
who were doing it as a donation as part of the project. And finally, uh, MCI was doing the VBNS, and finally the Internet 2. And by the way, one thing about many of those is the U.S. private industry was infinitely more generous than the European in donating communication facilities. Abilene had 2.5 gigabit services provided for free. I wish we had all of that. It would have made things work much faster in Europe. Well, what did the Europeans do? In 1984, in Ern started in Europe. By January 95, remarkably quickly, Denmark, France, Germany, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland were all part of Ern. Uh, and of course, uh, IBM also donated some of the links across the Atlantic. So this was very fast. Usually there was one international node, and national nodes had to be put in by the institutions including the links. By the way, these often had 9.6 kilobit links. And there was, one was encouraged uh, later, when Ern went over X25, to share lines with X25 infrastructure, and that actually made the whole question of X25 infrastructures easier because they were one of the bigger users, even in those countries where NRENs weren't properly underway. Some countries, particularly the UK, didn't want this imperialism, and they actually uh, sort of called it imperialism. They wanted to put up a wall and have just gateways on the outside, and I'm afraid I helped that. We did the, the translation between uh, the colored books and the internet protocols. Uh, if that's the way the British want to do it, okay. I didn't think it was the right way, but at least it allowed them to do their own developments. Uh, it was also very important for uh, Heinz Physics. Uh, they cared about these networks. The, uh, the IB IBM cared very strongly because the US labs, the big labs, all had mainframe computers. This was the time that everybody with a mainframe had an IBM mainframe. Or those which didn't were, were actually phasing them out. They might have had something else like control data for high speed computing, but they all had IBM mainframes. And so it was vital that they were on urn. And later, when IBM moved to uh, a, a supercomputer initiative, they went on to EasyNet, which was that. The, in 88, this initiative went to what IBM called at that stage supercomputers, but by that time, it was all TCP IP. And in 92, this became part of eBAME, merging also with EUNet, and that was really one of the dying but important parts of the protocol war as well. Well, what about the links of the European Emirates? Well, most of them developed as X21 5 ones with OSI protocol suites. From around 84, some started having bilateral links as countries wanted to have them with each other. These links were expensive and slow. Uh, the Europeans uh, already, uh, PTT, they already had international links between their private networks. So they had no real incentive to uh, provide free ones for international connectivity, and yet the costs of that international connectivity was very high. But something else, which most of us didn't realize quite how important it was at start in 84. The European Commission started the first framework program. And that was revolutionary in many ways. First of all, it involved industry. None of this coziness about it's only academics, you don't need to worry about it. Industry was in it. Industry was dominant in many of them. And they need to share. Well, for a long time, the uh, Commission uh, wrestled with the fact that international communications, if they went by the tariffs, sorry, uh, yes, I apologize. Uh, for a long time, the, at first, the European Commission wrestled with the problem that if they uh, just bought communications, the costs would be very high and it wouldn't really happen the way they wanted it. On the other hand, 
the PTTs uh, had commercial traffic on them, didn't want to lower them. So finally, uh, in 1987, the commission for the first time uh, started, uh, I think it was funding, the ICSI project, which had 64-bit kilobit lines, an X25 backbone in 18 countries. It provided free access to the NRENs and access charges for commercial organizations. And these access charges were very different in the different countries. Some still provided them free, some providing them at very high rates. So it didn't quite give the level playing field the commission would like, and that lasted until 92, although in the middle there was a change of the, uh, core of the prime contractor. And by that time, it wasn't obvious that the commission wanted to continue that, as if the uh, PTTs wanted that sort of thing. Well, now let's talk a bit about network coordination. All the mission-oriented groups had coordination from the beginning. If you are high energy physics groups, of course the high energy physics people talk to each other. If it was an earth sciences one, well, it was probably run from NASA, but there was probably a lot of connections from others as well. RARE started in 1986 as a discussion group. And it was only a discussion group for common problems. They ran, they'd already run the first European network shop uh, but uh, from 85 onwards, it was run by RARE. And then there was this project for cooperation for open systems, interconnected networks, COSI. That was an EC project. It was actually the, the ones who, as far as I remember, ran ICSI. It ran some pilots in X400, X500, security. Uh, so it not only uh, was, uh, was one which discussed a discussion group, by the time it got to the cosine, it was an implementation group, and it's no coincidence that the person who ran it in those days, uh, Di Davies, went on to run Dante. And then in 1990, another very important thing happened. There was the first joint workshop between RARE and EARN, which by that time had also included uh, UNET and a few others, and that was JENC, the Joint European Networking Conference. Well, in the meantime, what had happened about coordination of IP activities? Well, I said the internet had coordination from 1983 onwards. There's Internet Activity Board, International Collaboration Board, both set up uh, by DARPA. By 1986, Bob Kahn had left DARPA and started the Corporation for Research in National Initiatives. And the IETF started being run by his organization. Uh, I think this is wrong. I think the first non-US, actually, uh, the Amsterdam conference was in, uh, in 93, not in, uh, in 90. And that was the first time that one considered, so just 11 years ago, was the first time the IETF was run outside the US. RIPE was set up in 89 for administration and technical IP coordination. It was realized that there was no other organization which could really could or would do it. There's no way something like COSINE, with its emphasis on uh, open systems interconnection, OSI, would do that. And it was based in Amsterdam, and that's one of the reasons the first IETF was finally there in 93. And by 93, European wide networks were going to be procured. At this stage, one set up the uh, Terina, and for the delivery of, uh, of the actual procurement of these, one set up Dante. Both were owned by the NRENs. It's not up to me to go into the history of why they had to be separate organizations. I'm sure there are many people who can say more about that than I. Well, now let's talk about the European US links. DARPA's SatNet links had impact only for the UK internet, uh, the connection between the, between the uh, US networks and Janet Colored Book Service. The, others, uh, the other SatNet ones, for various reasons, did not have any real impact at all. But 
DARPA was not the only player. ESNet uh, was in charge of high energy physics and all the connections between the high energy physics labs and CERN. Uh, DOE, Department of Energy, was also in charge of the fusion research, very much concerned with links to Gaoxing, IPP Gaoxing. And so those were connections to, to EARN, via EARN and BitNet, and in fact, the first uh, ESNet DECnet one went to CERN not that long after. NASA ran SPAN and later NSN to its researchers in several countries, and they actually ran their computers in those countries, but wanted to have a shared uh, international infrastructure if they could. The NSF went to INRIA in France, Karlsruhe in Germany, and later Stockholm for NSFnet. And then later, all of them started joining some of the interchanges. There's one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. The costs started being borne by the lead federal agency, but access was provided uh, to all the federal nets. So for example, the uh, links to Gauching, uh, links to Germany and Switzerland were provided by the Department of Energy, although they could be used more broadly. The links to the UK were jointly funded by NASA and DARPA, originally NSF, but they dropped out. The links to Scandinavia and France were entirely paid as far as their half part by NSF. And that was uh, at least as difficult to achieve inside the US as it was to achieve collaboration between countries in Europe. Well, the EC co-funded Europanet. I've mentioned ICSI already, which by 90 was inadequate. But both because of the US links and local area networks, many countries wanted some TCP IP, even if it was still not quite the policy of the NRENs. By 92, the PTTs were competing with each other. Uh, quite a lot of uh, privatization had happened. And they really didn't want to uh, repeat the ICSI activity at higher bandwidth. They were often competing in each other's territory. Some NRENs wanted X25, some DECnet, some TCP IP. And so two things happened. First of all, there was the European multi-protocol backbone formed at two megabits, and that later became Europanet, uh, and that included many countries, and those links were at two megabits. But some people, some countries didn't like that whole structure. They didn't like EMPB, and they wanted pure IP. They agreed to set up an eBone. There were several main nodes, five of them. Later, some other countries joined. US links were provided by IBM from the EasyNet activity, three links. There were gateways to ICSI and later EMPB. And the links were somewhat lower because there you had a private initiative, uh, more or less private, competing with a combined uh, EC NREN initiative. Well, soon, Higher speed nets were needed. The PTTs liked ATM. So uh, for the first time, you started getting some research uh, parts of the community, uh, of the EC, agreeing to fund some of these pilots. And they funded the James Network, which was an ATM uh, infrastructure as a research pilot with only a few people could be connected. By 1994, one had completely finished the protocol war. Only IP survived, and the future, certainly the future academic nets, were pure IP. So one started 1034, 34 megabits, quantum, JANT, etc. By now we get into what we all know. That was Europanet, I think that was 97, 1034, quantum, uh, JANT, and uh, then. Uh, Jeanne started going into IPv6, and in fact, there's been a steady growth of IPv6. And this is a very interesting story. Uh, when the SixNet project started, it was not clear whether Jeanne would ever go to IPv6. I'm sure the general feeling was it would, but only when there was, quote, user demand for it but one doesn't easily get user demand for things like that. But when the SixNet 
project started. Uh, Dante was responsible for that network and the technology became possible, became clearly possible, and uh, it was agreed that Géant would start going that way. They set up their core configurations in February last year, pilot service in June, production service in October, and now 27 out of the 31 in Rins are connected, uh, and it's peering internationally pretty widely. Well, let's talk about foreign links again. The US was always different. Up to mid-90s, by foreign I mean for, uh, uh, from Europe. Up to 90s, there were some, a few bilateral agreements, uh, and these started changing as far as the US was concerned when Dante became in charge of all the procurements, or most of them. Ern already had links to Israel, Turkey, Cyprus. Uh, those links remained as the networks became European, and I was extremely interested to attend this morning's uh, UMedis Connect, where these are now firmly part of uh, EC funded projects. And there were long time there were links to Canada, China, Japan, Korea, the African part of France, etc. Uh, sometimes the links were just technical uh, uh, reasons for behind them, sometimes purely political. For instance, when the GS7 summit happened some four years ago, it was decided at the level of the heads of state that one should have the direct links. Well, there was no funding provided at the time, but that didn't matter. If the heads of state say so, then it happens, and Renata actually provided the first link, and now it's, going to grow much more, it's grown since then much more important. Well, then there were the EC programs. And after the breakup of the Soviet Union, lots and lots of people had special programs to deal with it. The EC ones concentrated on connecting to the European nets. First from 91, there was the EC FAIR program, which included a, f a first tier set of these. From 94, there's the FAIR and Insight project. That was actually, by that time, the web had come and that was to increase web access to many of these countries. 1034 had all the fair countries and a few others as well, and Japan and the US. UMEDIS includes all the Mediterranean countries. Siren treats the Balkan countries. Alice goes to South America. TIN will include Southern Asia. So clearly, huge amount of international uh, has been growing over the last few years. The European Commission, not the only one, the NATO Science for Peace Networking Panel uh, de deals with Europe, well, used to deal with for Eastern Europe, Russia, and the newly independent states. First of all, they started setting up NRENs and connecting uh, those with very limited bandwidth to the internet. From 96 to 2002, you started seeing high energy physics labs in quite a number of the countries which had high energy physics activities. That high energy physics mafia is always in the lead in these networking activities. They really do superbly. And that was partially funded by the German DFN, and DAISY was the mainstay of that. And so when, in 2001, we decided that we would like to have some regional networks because the interests of the NATO science for peace had moved further east, then uh, after a while, it became natural to have a, a VSAT system based on DAISY. And in fact, in that particular case, there was some generous additional funding from the EC on the management, from Cisco on lands, etc. So a lot of people started playing in this game. Uh, then uh, there are many others, like the US uh, Aid, IREX, the Open, Systems Initiative, uh, Open Society Initiative, the Soros Foundation, UNDP, World Bank, all have complementary development programs. And it's quite a challenge to, have, uh, to play in a uh, field where there are lots of people jockeying with lots of different amounts of money and different aims in what they're doing. It's fun. Well, so far we talked about networks. Well, in fact, networks are only interesting depending on what services they have. 
And the first set of DARPA activities started doing work on advanced services, like multicast and IPv6. They also had to be available for DARPA researchers, though fairly soon the DARPA researchers preferred to use uh, networks which were always there, rather than ones which sometimes were taken over for some of these research purposes. The gigabit networks were a little different. They were co-funded by NSF and DARPA, but they had a speed which was just not available for many others. So they were used for a limited number of applications. And so the next stage was to have the VBNS deliberately procured to provide a broader range of advanced services beyond those which by that time were available on the commercial internet. Even now, there are very few for which you could have multicast, and, those, uh, and, and then, then there were none. And then you had things, Internet 2, and that was put in for applications that needed high-speed and advanced services. With donated fiber, donated uh, routers, donated end state, uh, uh, often computers, although there was a charge to be part of it. In practice, it's a little difficult sometimes to define when one needed those advanced services uh, or whether and when one was using it because it was more convenient than using the commercial internet. But uh, at least it had a lot of advanced activities on it. And then finally, of course, uh, startup was put in for international entry to internet too. If you look at the European side, uh, some NRENs have a development. SurfNet had done it for a long time. Vernata, DFN, Ukerna have had it at different times to a different extent. Uh, by the way, I'm not, supply, I'm not implying that none of the other countries had. I just run out of space on slides. But normally, there's been a very limited resource for these research purposes. Jeant and some of the NRENs had special links into startup. However, at least until recently, they seldom made special arrangements inside their own NRENs. This has started to be an exception now. SixNet was an exception for IPv6 piloting. It paved the way for Géant to be dual stack fairly fast. Uh, it still is used for multicast, quality of services, and a few things like that. But I suspect those will be taken over fairly rapidly in Jeant. And Jeant 2, first of all, will in any case make special arrangements for grid computing. And second of all, for the first time, Jeant 2 has a specific part of these research, uh, these networks for researchers with a research activity as an integral part of the project. This whole question of advanced service is a difficult one. Uh, you can't actually do anything with advanced services uh, properly until you can widely deploy them and see the problems in actually mounting them. The first really widespread distributed uh, service of this type was, was uh, <coughs> Uh, various uh, 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 things caused by the web, which required universal protocols. In any case, if the protocol war hadn't been virtually finished, the web would have uh, finished it in any case, because it could not survive these vast, peculiar gateways of one sort or another. It has actually led to an unparalleled need because of huge deployment and additions like image, streaming, and real-time services. None of the other earlier services really went to, to, the, to anything like the same scale. Adequate speed's necessary on these, but it's not sufficient for many of the advanced services. One's had video conferencing by various EC and national projects. Some variants require multicast. Voice over IP is coming rapidly. Streaming services available. But all of these need much better application support and quality of service support. And it is very difficult to see quite how one gets this 
uniform application support provided in our present structure. Uh, we have some support nationally, very, very limited support uh, on a European-wide basis, uh, but it's very important. There's still a certain amount of tension between advanced services and normal services. I'm sure there's a reason, but for instance, with the SixNet project, one can uh, do work on SixNet itself and have services. You can have services go SixNet into Géant as an access service, uh, as access network. You can't yet go proper peering so that from Géant you go to the SixNet. There's something or other around here where one still has some questions on policies which aren't quite resolved. Well, let's go a little bit on the future. There's an emerging generation of optical networks that raises some very interesting, difficult, and technical challenges. There's a huge possibilities for high-speed applications. You can start, have wavelength partitioning of networks, providing really true isolation between communities, networks, organizations, whatever you like. Uh, luckily, from somewhere around between 1998-1999 and 2003-04, there was an over-provisioning over of international fibers. Some of it's now being donated. There's this Gloriad project linking in China, Russia, and on to Europe. There's a new generation of worldwide optical interconnects coming into being. This is, most of this is now operational. Those which aren't are coming in, and I've been hearing that there are quite a few more which will come in shortly. So you're starting to get a worldwide uh, optical network uh, interconnect coming in. It's not yet clear whether this is a technology activity. Some people want it as a high energy physics test bed or a, a astronomy test bed. Uh, certainly, some very, very interesting work will go on in how you provision what services on it. To what extent uh, this becomes services, to what extent it becomes research, uh, I, this is a very, very unpopular, for good reason, diagram from the point of view of Géant. You see the top right-hand corner over here? That's Géant. <laughs> that's that's where the way the optical network people look at that world. Obviously, you could uh, do a nice mathematic inversion of that and have Géant in the middle and all these optical networks as small things around it, but a keynote speaker is supposed to be provocative, so I'll show this one. Well, there are drivers to further growth. There's distance education, large-scale conferencing, teleconsultation, grid. All of these could be huge growth drivers. The international growth could exceed local and national growth. There's this uh, peculiarity that obviously distance education, large-scale conferencing, etc., must be more expensive to do internationally than just nationally. Uh, but uh, they're much more useful internationally as well. There's uh, huge differences in the, in the data collections which different national communities uh, collect. You're not yet using fully the fact that there are these differences which uh, could be utilized superbly in research, in by which I mean real academic research in culture and history. Person-to-person real-time services are hardly used so far. There's such a massive over-provisioning at the moment of some of the high-speed networks that you could do a limited amount of voice over IP, much more than you're doing at this moment. For very large scale, a lot more work has to be done. There's widespread use of mobile access techniques already uh, with ADSL, there's so far very little linking between the cellular technologies and uh, the research networks. That will happen. 
But there are constraints. There's inadequate application support. I've mentioned that already. There's the current base of charging and payments. It's all very well to say distance education and telemedicine are powerful drivers. However, with telemedicine, uh, presumably it's somebody far away who gets paid, not the local doctor, or at least he has to share things somewhat. With distance education, I don't know in general, but most places uh, actually finance education depending on the number of students they have. The incentive to import education uh, from elsewhere is not too clear, and the uh, remuneration from exporting it is not too clear. We have a strange market around some of that. Uh, we're not that ready to rely on remote computation. Uh, on the whole, people like their own PC or their own institutional computer. I've been pretty horrified at how little of the big grid computing project so far actually use wide area grid computing. Almost all of them build up their own clusters. There are some very interesting projects which when they are successful should make this much easier and effortless, but so far most of the big applications don't use it very much. They might do some data acquisition that way, but not very much more. It's all very well to talk about complete grid computing in which everything talks to everything else in electricity grid. I was just recently, last week, at a meeting where all we wanted to do was to show some IP services, which had to be distributed. We chose to go to a university rather than a commercial organization because it was going to be such a pain to allow uh, proper internet access from inside the commercial organization. We are way from knowing how or when to allow security uh, considerations uh, to be ignored or to be dealt with in going between commercial organizations. There are international barriers. Language prob uh, is a quite a serious problem. Intellectual property considerations aren't nearly resolved yet. And we, ha uh, not only can't I spell, but nationalistic concerns still exist very, very strongly. There's still problems, there's a pride in doing things nationalistically. There's a lot of questions about what should be censored and what shouldn't be censored under what conditions in what countries. Yeah? Yep, I, luckily I am. <laughs> the first decade brought a large backbones uh, up to low megabits per second. It resolved the protocol walls and made remote communication standard and gave way, uh, web access. There were advanced islands with real-time services and gigabit, but only islands. The second brought backbones to, f uh, to low gigabits. It provided remote access at megabits, real-time communications, etc. Many of the remoter regions had the facility of the previous decade in the more advanced regions. The movement in Géant, in only 15 months in the two IPs showed how much faster backbones could move now than earlier. The next decade has technical capabilities almost in place to remove all the constraints of, dis of distance in academia. But you're still gonna need to do a lot on the organizations, financial, and political changes to realize that full potential. I think there will be, a, there is still a huge place for uh, academic networks. Uh, Internet 2Y, Giant, etc., have shown how important they are. I'm quite sure the next keynote in 10 years' time will be very different. Electronic diffusion to the whole should be a matter of course, but we still expect TNC 2014 to be needed. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Peter, for a wonderful perspective on uh, the historical events of the internet and some uh, future looks.
for all of us to bear in mind. So now we're going to take a break. Um, it's around 3.30. If you can reconvene here at 4 p.m. for the start of the next session, that would be great. And I believe there's tea and coffee outside. Thank you very much. Ένα-δύο, ένα-δύο. Ένα-δύο, ένα-δύο. 